From the Missouri School of Journalism, this is Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. It's hardly uncommon for parents to be worried their teenagers are spending too much time online. But in China, the concern is particularly acute. Internet cafes in cities there often team with young men playing online games for hours on end. Now, according to one 2009 survey, an estimated 24 million people in China between the ages of 14 and 29 were classified as internet addicts. Now, medical authorities in most countries, including the U.S., don't recognize internet addiction as a disease. But in 2008, China's health officials became the first to ident officially identify it as a clinical disorder. Now, one outcome has been the opening of about 300 to 400 internet addiction treatment centers. Many of the centers resemble military schools, and the patients are forced to do exercise, march to class, and of course, are barred from using the internet. These boot camps have generated a lot of controversy in China, in part because of allegations that young people are sometimes physically abused in them, and even held against their will. Now on this edition of Global Journalist, a look at internet addiction in China. In a few minutes, we'll hear from some different people with different perspectives on this issue. But first, we're going to talk to Shosh Lam. She's an Israeli filmmaker who directed the 2013 documentary Web Junkie, which followed three Chinese teenagers obsessed with online gaming. Shosh, welcome to Global Journalist. Hi. Well, first of all, tell me if you would, how did you get interested in making a documentary about internet addiction in China? Um, I was not brought up on internet and I was and I am very concerned how internet uh, changed uh, human relationship. Uh, we think and uh, that we are more connected but I think that we created a new solitude. So uh, with this idea, I heard that uh, in China, the using of internet is very extreme and China is the first and only one to declare it as a clinic disorder. So I thought that if I want to bring up the dark side of the internet, I should go to China and that's what I did. Well, your film, it, it follows the lives of some young men who spend a lot of time playing online multiplayer video games like uh, World of Warcraft, and they end up in this well-known internet addiction center in China. But tell us just a little bit about what the lives of these teenagers are like before they end up in this rehab center. So before, uh, I mean, they drop off school, they are in internet cafes for days wearing diapers, not to lose one precious moment of the game. Uh, and they are, uh, they lost, you know, social life. Uh, they lost social life and they are very lonely. And where, they're, where they are very lonely, they are getting very depressed. And then they are escaping to the virtual world. And um, this loneliness, by the way, uh, a research was done lately in the United States, is increasing numbers of teenagers uh, committing suicide or trying to commit suicide. So they are uh, forced to come into this rehab center for uh, four months by their parents. Uh, for instance, I mean, uh, the, uh, the parents will give them uh, a sleeping pill at night, and when they wake up in the morning, they are behind bars in a military camp. And as you described, uh, it's a military camp and, uh, you know, uh, and very high discipline. Yeah, well, tell, uh, us, tell us just about, like, the daily routine inside this center. Uh, you went to one, I think it's in, uh, called, like, the Daxing Center near Beijing. What, what do people do there in the morning? So uh, when they wake up, like, at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning, it's uh, exercising, uh, of course, cleaning their rooms, and they began uh, uh, with therapies. They are going through therapies between themselves and between them and their parents. Their parents are called to participate in this uh, process. Not all of them are showing up, but uh, 
you know, you discover that uh, these escape to the virtual world, uh, you know, uh, are coming uh, from very problematic uh, relationship in their family. And we have to remember that these kids are only, they are, uh, you know, an only child uh, in the family. Uh, they are, you know, the ones of the uh, one child policy that are, uh, you know, in, uh, were in China, uh, was in China. And uh, so for these parents, I mean, this uh, rehab center is the last, you know, uh, uh, place that they can, you know, save their child. Um, their children also uh, are getting anti-depression pills. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, they're going through therapies and they're, go and they're you know, getting lectures. Uh, and uh, of course they are, you know, not allowed to use any device. Well, I know that these have been controversial in China, in part because there have been some well-publicized incidents of uh, physical abuse of the patients. Sometimes even the patients after they leave, I believe, have attacked their parents. In one case, a young woman uh, was reported starved her mother to death. Tell us a little bit about some of the controversy that has followed these types of centers. So, uh, you know, I went to China after I saw on the Australian television uh, uh, that one of the children was beaten to death in one of these camps. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, the children are, uh, you know, uh, they have guards uh, that are, you know, uh, are in, in charge of, of them and you know sometimes uh, these guards are not very you know pleasant and uh, and are very sometimes aggressive so uh, you know I didn't see and and in some of the camps that what I heard I didn't see it I mean they are uh, also using uh, uh, electrical shocks oh electroshock uh, treatment that was one of the allegations against some of yes. the camps yeah, I didn't see it in this camp, so I cannot tell you that I saw it. But yes, but I saw, I saw, uh, you know, uh, a very, very uh, aggressive, you know, behavior from the guards to the, to the, to the children. Well, Shoshlam, thanks so much for joining us on Global Journalist. Thank you. A reminder that you're tuned into Global Journalist on today's program. We're talking about China's efforts to deal with so-called internet addicts, usually young men who may spend six hours or more every day playing online games like World of Warcraft or League of Legends. To continue our discussion, we're going to bring in another person who has followed us closely. Joining us in Shanghai is Zigor Aldama. He's an East Asia correspondent for the Spanish newspaper El País and Spain's Grupo Vocento news organization. Zigor, welcome. Hello. Well, you've reported on this issue extensively. You've lived in China for quite some time. Parents all over the world, I think, are concerned about how much time their kids spend in front of screens and on the Internet. Is there something like different or peculiar about what's happening in China? I just think it's the scale of it. Uh, basically, we have 730 million Internet users in China, and uh, most of them are young people. Uh, and according to statistics by, by the government itself, 10% of those minors using the Internet are either addicts or at risk of uh, getting addicted to the, to the Internet. So uh, we do see, like Shos said, uh, and we are seeing now, a lot of Internet cafes called Wamba here, uh, where people go to play endlessly, like uh, they, they really spend their days, uh, sometimes uh, they say that it's even uh, cheaper to spend the night in a Wamba because uh, it's, it's much cheaper than a, than a hotel. So they just they stay there, uh, they live there, they eat there, uh, and they even make friends there. So um, basically what we see here is that uh, the so-called addicts are playing much more than I think they do play in the West. Uh, some of the, of the kids that we interview uh, finally admitted to play maybe 20 hours straight, 
some of them maybe four days with uh, very little sleep. So actually, I think there is a uh, reason to, uh, for concern, and I understand that parents are really worried about uh, basically, you know, uh, the fact that they are losing opportunities in this very competitive society where, um, you know, getting good grades is much more important than anywhere else. Well, you talked about uh, this so classification it's... of addiction and the statistic that something like 10% of sort of teenagers, young people are, you know, addicted to the Internet. But what, is that, what does that mean, Internet addiction? Is there like a clear... Is there a clear definition that, of it? That's the problem. That's the problem that there is no clear definition of what is internet addiction. Uh, sometimes, you know, Tauran, who is actually uh, the the head of this of this boot camp, which uh, both Shosh and, and later I visited, and he's one like the leading the leading uh, scientist or psychologist uh, uh, pushing for this. Um, uh, he says that. Even six or or hours of playing video games per day, or of course above that, should be considered internet addiction. Uh, many people disagree. Uh, many people say that uh, well, this is just uh, what teenagers do, and that it will pass with the time. Uh, some of them say that uh, well, uh, the statistics he gives, uh, which say that 90% of of the kids that are in his um, in his center are depressed. Uh, Fifty-eight percent uh, suffer domestic violence. Uh, this means that the problem is not really with the internet, but with uh, the families themselves, with parenting, and that's also one of the reasons why he is pushing for parents to uh, join this therapy in the center. Well, tell us, I know that you met a number of the young people who are at these centers and their families. Tell us maybe just the story of one of them to sort of highlight you know what their what their lives are like mm -hmm. yeah well i i remember very clearly a, um, a young kid who just arrived at the center and his parents told him that they were just uh, going for a vacation to beijing because they were from uh, inner mongolia which is about a thousand kilometers away from from the capital of china right uh and and he just arrived there uh without any knowledge of what was going on and suddenly he started to uh, feel something was not right. Uh, suddenly, he found himself in such a you know military environment, uh, and they just told him, you know, you are going to be locked here for the next maybe three to six months uh, because we believe that you are an internet addict. And they explained the situation, uh, and then I remember that he was outraged and he was uh, going for the mother, shouting at her, uh, tried to beat her. Uh, then I that, that that was you know the most tense moment when I saw the nurses coming with the restraints and with uh, some injection I believe it was some kind of tranquilizer uh, and after that well uh, he saw that he was not going to get out from there so he calmed down and I guess with time he accepted the the fact right Tauran Tauran himself he said that uh, uh, many of the kids they tried to escape from the center in the first uh, 20 days. And maybe after that they get acclimatized uh, because uh, some of them actually agree that they have a problem. And I agree that the therapy that they are getting in the center helps them, helps them to get in shape because there is a lot of exercise and many of them are out of shape. They don't move and hey, uh, helps them also to build social relationships with the, with the other kids because they have nothing to do. It's basically boring. Uh, uh, apart from, you know, doing exercise and doing some kind of uh, uh, therapy with psychologists, they have nothing to do, so they start to play games, and we could see how uh, those uh, young kids... You mean like real-life games rather than online games? Yeah, yeah, they, they, they were playing like cards, you know, they were playing cards or they were reading books. Uh, and, you know, those who just came to the center, you could see them that they were afar, they were sitting in, in a corner, they were trying, you know, to keep themselves um, apart from the rest. But, you know, uh, slowly they were uh, building some relationships and uh, some of them, they really thought, OK, uh, this real world, maybe it's not that, as bad as I thought. Right. Uh, and and how run is that um, 75 percent of the kids that he, he treats, uh, well, they 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 go back to life and, they, you know, 
keep uh, doing what they should be doing or what the parents think that they should be doing, while 25% are not cured, if we can use that so word. So they claim, they claim a 75% success rate. So that seems like a fairly good rate. But Zigor, I'm sorry, we're just right. out of time uh, for today, but want to thank you again for taking the time to join us today. Oh, thank you very much. You're tuned into Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On today's program, we're talking about the issue of internet addiction in China. China is one of the few countries in the world to have officially recognized internet addiction as a psychological disorder. Now, if you're interested in more coverage of underreported international news, visit us at globaljournalist.org. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Twitter, or subscribe to the videocast of this program on YouTube. Now, we just spoke with the documentary maker Sho uh, Shalom and the China correspondent Zigor Aldama about this phenomenon. Now, to broaden our discussion, we're going to bring in two other guests. Joining us from New York is Marcela Shablovich. She's an assistant professor of communication studies at Pace University who researches Chinese internet culture. And in Fall City, Washington, is Hillary Cash. She's a psychotherapist and chief clinical officer at Restart Life, a treatment center outside Seattle for internet and gaming addicts. She's also traveled to China to observe treatment there. Let me start with you, Marcella Shablovich. You've researched China's digital culture for some time, and you trace concern about gaming addiction, internet addiction, back to um, a specific incident. Tell us, tell us where you think this all got started. Sure. Well, in 2002, there was a notorious fire in an internet cafe in Beijing, and a number of young men died. Um, they were locked inside the cafe because the cafe was operating illegally, and so when the fire uh, broke out, none of them were able to escape. It was a particularly tragic incident. Um, but this really set off a panic, what I would call a moral panic, about uh, the state of internet cafes in China and specifically what young people are doing in internet cafes, which is, uh, for the most part, playing internet games in these sort of all-night gaming sessions. And I think since 2002 on, um, there has been a great deal of media attention in China um, about this subject of internet gaming and problematic internet use. And I think while, you know, there are some young people who do have a problematic relationship to the internet, uh, the media coverage has grossly exaggerated the scale of the problem uh, to the extent that parents are simply panicked uh, about this issue and um, willing to resort to anything to try to, quote unquote, save their children. Well, you raise a good point. I want to I want to throw this to Hillary Cash then. Your center, Restart Life, I understand it's one of the only residential internet addiction treatment facilities in the U.S. And you've also been to China to visit some clinics there. Talk to us just a little bit about how this issue is treated both at your clinic and how is it the same or different as how it's treated in China? I think that the goal, the, the overall goals are similar. Um, it's a concern about uh, young adults, let's just talk about young adults and, um, and older teenagers, really not being functional uh, and wanting to provide treatment so that they can be, you know, functional uh, mem members of the larger community. But the, uh, our approaches are quite different. Uh, as you know, the approach in China tends to be a, a pretty harsh boot camp approach. I didn't, I didn't tour the facility in Beijing long enough to really get a keen se sense myself. But having also watched <laughs> Web Junkies, you know, I learned a lot more than I had just on my tour. And and our own philosophy is that you can get people to change using positive psychology. So our approach is much uh, gentler and kinder. We, we want them to be physically healthy and fit. We want them to have a safe uh, social environment. We want them to learn uh, both psychological, communication, and life skills that they lack so that they can be highly functional. Um, and and we do that within a small intimate setting rather than the large, huge uh, setting of that uh, treatment facility that I saw in Beijing. So there, I think, is just a more punitive approach. It's boot camp approach. And um, 
I don't really know what their outcomes are. They claim very high levels of success, but I don't really know for sure how successful they are. Um, I know our our rates of success are fairly high as well, but I think it's for, for uh, I mean, our approach is just different. Well, Marcella, I wanted to pick up on an issue that was raised earlier in the show, and that is sort of around the culture of uh, the sort of online, massive multiplayer role-playing games. You've compared gaming in China as sort of, uh, you've compared it with like underage drinking in the U.S. as a form of teenage rebellion. Talk to us just a little bit about that. Sure. Well, I think that from my perspective, the largest issue with the discourse of internet addiction is that it targets a behavior that society deems to be deviant and or harmful. Um, something that people, mainly adults, see as harming a young person's ability to lead a normal life. But what is normal and who gets to define what is normal? Um, underage drinking uh, is fairly normal, um, but because we as a society um, deem it to be wrong for young people under the age of 18 or 21 to drink alcohol, um, we stigmatize that activity. Uh, similarly, we um, stigmatize internet use uh, because a lot of adults don't understand or approve of internet use. And I think that um, this is one of the issues that people working in the field of internet addiction need to grapple with. Um, while again, I think there are cases in which some young people use the internet to access, um, the vast majority of young people that I have talked to in China don't have a problematic relationship to the internet. They are very conscious of their choice to play games um, and they are in control of that decision. And when we try to tell young people that they are addicted, uh, we rob them of agency. We rob them of the ability to make choices and control their own life choices. And um, so for me, I think, yes, we need to see playing games as a form of rebellion and um, well, let's, recognize let's, let's that Let's just toss this back to Hillary acceptable. Cash then for a moment. I mean, Marcella raises an interesting point here. Is some of what's happening around this concern about Internet use, is it simply a generational divide in the same way an older generation disapproved of rock and roll music or other sort of different technologies or communication forms? Yeah, I don't actually disagree with what she's saying um, in general, but we're working with, you, you know, we now conceptualize addiction as happening on a spectrum from mild to severe. And the people who are coming in uh, to our treatment facility are all at the severe end of that. They are people who have tried to moderate their computer use and have been unsuccessful at it. These are people who have failed out of college after years of uh, lying about what was going on and their parents spending, you know, many thousands of dollars on, you know, for college and these people not being able to uh, complete their coursework. These are folks who are severely physically unfit and unhealthy because of, of years spent in front of a screen. Um, they come to us and they are depressed. Many of them are suicidally depressed. They're socially anxious, very, very withdrawn, uh, really avoiding people and, and social contact. They lack the skills that they need to regulate their own emotional states. They have traits of personality disorders. They're, they're very dependent rather than independent and so forth. So at the extreme end of internet addiction, um, people are really quite dysfunctional when they come to us. Well, talk to us, if you would, about sort of how psychiatrists in the U.S. think about this. I mean, I understand that it is not categorized as a clinical disorder here. Is there some discussion about that? Oh, yeah. So the the DSM-5 has Internet Gaming Disorder. Sorry, so this is sort of like the Bible of, of psychiatry then? Right. Okay. And uh, it has Internet Gaming Disorder listed at the back as as a proposal something requiring further study and uh, being considered for future inclusion once the study results come in, which I think is a perfectly sensible approach uh, right now. 
uh, we are doing, there's lots of research going forward in this area. And once the weight of that research uh, becomes irrefutable, then it's going to be uh, given its full status. Well, Marcella, my understanding is that there is actually like kind of an interesting difference in how, you know, boys use the Internet and girls use the Internet or young men and young women do when it comes to sort of problematic Internet use. What, what can you tell us about that, particularly as it relates to, to the Chinese situation? Um, well, I think that's an interesting question. Um, you do see trends in terms of young men gravitating towards different types of games than young women would necessarily play, um, using it in different ways, perhaps. Um, but uh, I think that the concern uh, about young boys and gaming um, is simply uh, sort of an outgrowth of the fact that young men play these games in internet cafes in China in greater numbers than young women do. Uh, young women might use uh, the internet in different ways and in different locations. A lot of the young women that I have talked to don't like going to internet cafes because they think that they're sort of not very nice locations or um, that they may be unsafe for them. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure that I would argue that there is a um, huge difference um, in the way that young women and young men are using the internet. But certainly we do see a lot of young men gravitating towards games that are like these multiplayer role-playing games that have been um, said to be more immersive and therefore more addictive. Um, but I'm not sure I necessarily uh, always agree with that. Well, Hillary Cash, our time does grow short, but if you could just uh, jump in on that and then, you know, please do tell us, where do you see this issue moving over the next three years, the next five years? Uh, first, just a comment about what we were discussing, and that is that uh, in the nine, almost nine years that we've been open, we have had no more than seven women coming to the facility. So I think there definitely uh, is a vast difference, which I will not I mean, I can only hypothesize about why that is. And where this is moving, I have a lot of concern about where it's moving because the technology, the goal of uh, game designers and pornographers and so forth is to create the most immersive experience possible. And the more immersive an experience is, the more likely it is to become addictive. So that's the direction the technology is going. And the other concern I have is that parents are not very well aware of uh, the ways in which this technology, uh, which is so mesmerizing for young children, can really uh, interfere with their normal child development. So I have a lot of concerns. That's going to have to do it for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute and KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Our thanks to Shosh Lam, Zigor Aldama, Marcella Shablovich, and Hilary Cash for joining us. Assistant producers this week are Maria Cajon, Denitsa Tsikova, and Yanchi Tsu. Rachel Foster Gimbel and Lauren Wortman are supervising producers. Alisa Blyle is a visual editor. Our audio engineer is Aaron Hay. Travis McMillan is director. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in.